why don't we circle back to this? Because I think there'll be a lot of discussion over the subsequent uh, presentations as well. Let me see if Sue Suido uh, can come forward and talk to us about DSM-5. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. It was two years ago that I came and gave you um, our proposed changes, and this update is somewhat different in that there has been little change in the criteria, quite a bit of um, uh, developments in the text, but a whole lot of attention in the, the media and um, on our public comment site. And uh, Asperger disorder, autism, and the autism spectrum disorders continue to receive the most public comments and run about 10 times higher than any other diagnosis. So it's certainly received a lot of attention. And our committee has been working hard on this actually for five years. And so the uh, flurry of activity at the end was a bit surprising to us because of the fact that we had worked very hard as we were going along to develop the scientific base to justify our changes. But we also recognize that some of the things we are uh, discussing and planning to propose are uh, somewhat controversial. They've certainly generated headlines uh, varying from the New York Times accusation that we would exclude as many as 35 percent of high-functioning individuals or those with Asperger disorder and then it actually got picked up on the Reuters News Service as 65 percent so we were getting rid of two-thirds of autism and that then led us to be uh, charged with having tried to nip the epidemic in the bud by changing the diagnosis. I assure you, as I have others, that that was never our intention, and in fact, um, it's quite contrary to what our process has been, our policies, and certainly our intent. The concerns uh, fall into three categories currently, and I'll address each of these um, briefly um, due to time. First is that sensitivity was sacrificed in order to improve specificity. For those of you who don't use sensitivity and specificity on a routine basis, sensitivity is the number of cases that you pick up that are actually there and that you miss who actually aren't there, whereas specificity is the ability to catch only the cases that you're actually describing. And for autism spectrum disorders, because of its overlap with so many other neurodevelopmental conditions and with neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, specificity has been indeed a large problem particularly in DSM-4, where attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is an exclusionary diagnosis. So if you have a diagnosis of autism, you can't have ADHD and vice versa. And so if you have a child in need of a great number of services because of their severe ADHD and relatively minor social skills uh, deficits, they still might get a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder. In DSM-4, it would be PDD-NOS in order to provide appropriate therapy to that child. There were also concerns raised about the fact that the social communication domain had been changed from two separate sub-criterion to one, and that we were requiring all of those elements to be met. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And similarly, in the restricted interest and repetitive behavior domain, it's just a single domain, and therefore we are requiring that individuals have two out of the four um, possibilities. There's been a lot of attention paid to our proposal to merge Asperger disorder into the autism spectrum disorder as a loss of identity for those who currently um, are diagnosed or self-diagnosed with Asperger disorder and in fact have uh, social networks which they um, identify as Aspies and more importantly the loss of uniqueness um, attributed to the Asperger diagnosis disorder. I think that that uniqueness is actually a reflection of the common use in the clinic of an Asperger diagnosis. Because when you, when you look at the DSM-4 criteria and compare autism and Asperger side by side, Asperger is actually the more severe condition. It requires a quantitative impairments, whereas autism is only qualitative. The difference there being that in Asperger's disorder, they don't have to have early language delays. So it's been used um, with some frequency for individuals that didn't have an early history. That item we specifically fixed in DSM-5 by allowing current by history and when history is not um, uh, 
possible or um, present than you can imply from the other symptomatology. And then the final criticism has been the pre post DSM-5 research studies won't be comparable. My uh, work has been in both autism and in obsessive compulsive disorder, and I know in Tourette's syndrome this was a huge issue when we went from DSM-3R to 4. So we've been very sensitive that we not do anything to make uh, previous research useless. However, I would challenge those who've raised this criticism to try and compare across studies using the current um, diagnostic criteria because one group applies PDD and OS um, criteria in very different ways than another group, and I'll show you some of those data. So as I've already said, three, do, uh, three diagnostic domains will become two, a domain of social communication and one of restrictive repetitive behaviors. Rhett disorders and other etiologic subgroups will be described by use of a specifier, and that specifier is associated with known medical or genetic condition or environmental factor. As we originally tried to think of the subcategories of autism that would be required in order to uh, describe the current panoply of uh, known associations and potential etiologic factors, it just was overwhelming. And by doing this, you actually allow the clinicians to specify all of the factors they believe to be associated. So it might not only be tuberous sclerosis complex, but also uh, fetal alcohol exposure and others. PDD will re be replaced by the autism spectrum disorder, and individual diagnoses will be merged into a single behaviorally defined disorder. So the, the concern that DSM-5 was so much more restrictive and difficult than DSM-4 frankly took us a little bit by surprise because we were working the other way and, and I show you two examples of that. First in DSM-4, the checklist item is currently failure to develop, I don't know what's happening, failure to develop peer relationships or abnormal and abnormal social play, whereas we recommend including higher order of impairments of difficulties adjusting behavior to suit different social contexts. So these are the individuals who might be missed until they get to the junior high lunchroom, and in that instance, they just can't um, navigate the complex social interactions that are required. Similarly, we tried to address that in the age, recognizing that neurodevelopmental disorders begin prior to birth, shortly after birth, or sometime during the developmental period. DSM-4 had required the symptoms be present prior to the age of three years. However, we had experienced and, and know of individuals in whom the deficits are present early in childhood, but because of a sheltered early preschool environment or even grade school environment, they might not be fully manifest until the social demands exceed capacity. And we literally specify that that could be during later adolescence or young adulthood. Asperger's syndrome and PDD-ONOS within one ASD diagnosis, this was a matter of going where the science was. And that was the fact that currently there is a great deal of variability in how the criteria are applied, and particularly even among states, institutionalized differences in diagnostic criteria. And I didn't separate out the data I'm going to show you from our field trials, but it was just so striking that if you are looking at data from California, 90% plus of the individuals will have diagnosis of autism because that's what is coded and receives funding, PDD, ONOS, and Asperger disorder do not. Whereas in other states, they don't make that distinction between them, and so you have a broader use of the criteria. Lack of accurate historical information about the ver very early language development, since that was really the only thing separating Asperger from autism, we felt it reasonable to uh, merge those two together. And then finally, if you control for verbal IQ, there's a complete overlap in the symptoms, but excuse me, in the samples between autism and, and Asperger disorder. This slide shows that overlap with various sites within the Simons collection. And what you can see is that there's some variability. There's almost a, uh, a bimodal curve in some of the, the sites, whereas others have a very high use of, um, excuse me, very high scores right in the mean. But what, whichever site you're at, what you see is that there's quite a bit of spread around um, the areas of impairment and symptomatology. The Simons collection data were used uh, as part of a number of, of samples, including those from the CPA and START centers and others that had been archived. 
and within the Simons collection, this data is now um, out in publication, what we saw was that at various sites, the use of the PDD NOS shown in red and Asperger's disorder shown in white just varied by site uh, much more than it did by uh, um, other determinable factors. So, in summary, there's going to be a single spectrum, but recognizing that there's significant individual variability, we are asking clinicians to use a number of specifiers, including the severity of the ASD symptoms. There will be severity um, anchors for social communication domain as well as for the restricted repetitive um, symptoms domain. To talk about the pattern of onset, whether or not regression has been present and whether that regression was acute as well, well as the clinical course. Was this an individual who had minor deficits up until um, school age or beyond? Etiologic factors when known and associated conditions when not known. And associated conditions would also include the frequently comorbid conditions of epilepsy and GI disturbances. And then finally, individual weaknesses and strengths, because one of the things that became very clear was that the individual's overall IQ was a better determinant in many cases of ultimate outcome than was the severity of the autism symptoms. We have, uh, as one of several diagnoses conducted, excuse me, subjected to field trials, the autism spectrum disorder criteria proposed for DSM-5 underwent field trials at Stanford and at Bay State Medical Center. And so there were a total of 293 individuals at those two sites in whom an ASD diagnosis was to be considered. I merged the data just because I didn't want to get try and explain how all it went. Um, but in general, the process was that people were put into a, um, a bin based on their DSM-4 diagnosis and then those bins were, uh, had minimum numbers that could be included. So there was quite a few of the children who had an ASD diagnosis, but they had a self-injurious um, non-suicidal behavior, and so they were put in that bin because that was a more rare condition. For purposes of today's discussion, I merged them together, and we remember we were talking about 293 um, children and adolescents up to the age of 18 of whom 214 did not have a DSM-4 diagnosis of autism, Asperger disorder, or PDD-NOS. 79 did, and you can see the distribution there um, in the blue. Then, using DSM-5 criteria to interview those same subjects, 19 of those who had not had a DSM-4 criteria were then given a DSM-5 diagnosis of ASD and 10 were given a diagnosis of social communication disorder, which is very, very similar to ASD, except it does not have the second domain of restrictive repetitive behaviors. Notice that among the 35 individuals with autistic disorder, all of them received a DSM-5 diagnosis. We lost three children with Asperger disorder out of 21, and five with PDD-NOS out of 23. My work group uh, met in June. We were reviewing those tapes, and of the two that I saw who had had were in this PDD-NOS group, it was very clear that they were put there for the, the example I talked to with you about earlier. The, their ADHD symptoms were extremely severe. However, we are concerned that our uh, criteria may not be applicable and valid, as has been published in a number of papers now. Our um, charge would be to please require that such studies be done prospectively or at least using um, a wider data set than data gathered with DSM-3 criteria because those just didn't ask the same kinds of questions. So for more information, the APA has a website open. The public comment has closed but is actually still open in that they continue to receive emails and to pass those on to us. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. We've got about three minutes for questions, so uh, let's start with Noah. Hi. Uh, I'm just wondering if it was intentional that the language of the new uh, criteria allowed for the existence of autistic people who did not qualify as having autistic disorder. Yes, to include the, ch the individuals who previously would have had a diagnosis of PDD-NOS. No, I was just thinking in a general sense, like, 
I can look at these criteria and say, though I may be autistic, I may not qualify for autistic disorder based on these criteria. Was that an intentional choice on your part? Because when I read it, I thought that it was. I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. The idea that you can be autistic but not qualify for autistic disorder was this part of the um, process. Was this something you were Absolutely about? not, and okay. we don't believe that we've done that, actually. I, I would okay. challenge anybody to look at the specific criteria, which... Mm -hmm are here and not be able to find, not be able to meet all three of the deficits in social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction, mm -hmm. and developing and maintaining relationships. Because when you look at the way those are defined, the nonverbal communicative behaviors is not just absence of eye gaze, which people can be trained to have and therefore would no longer meet the old criteria, but could have difficulties with integrating the verbal and nonverbal communication. Okay, thank you. Jim? My question would be, children that have um, behavior intervention, they could actually lose the repetitive yes. field, so then are you going to move them to the social communicative no, disorder then? At the very top, and if we have to, we'll put it in every single line in here, currently or by history. We had some superb advice um, from individuals in lots of different groups, but one of the most um, important to us was making sure that if a person not even had been received behavioral interventions that removed that symptom, but if they were in a, a supportive environment in which those symptoms weren't manifest, that they shouldn't lose their diagnosis and therefore lose their, their symptoms. I think the example was given to us, if you need a crutch to be able to walk, but you walk perfectly fine with that crutch, you don't want to then say, you don't need the crutch anymore. John? One uh, question that I haven't seen addressed is um, in the new release of DSM-5, will we see uh, the uh, use of the uh, Asperger and PDD-NOS words supported in the continuing language, even though they are now part of the ASD, so that someone who was describing himself as being a person with Asperger's today would correctly say that about himself next year? Yes, absolutely. Um, that's actually been also a matter of contention, and the you have not seen it published yet, um, but it is part of the text. That so that that is going to hold true. Somebody can still say Asperger's. Yes, and it'll be a recognized part of of the spectrum. Yes, our limitation there is that we have to use the dis the definition that is in DSM four in order to bring that forward into DSM five. So and what? I'm sorry, I was just going to, what I was going to conclude by saying is that for many of the individuals who um, are concerned about now losing their diagnosis, they didn't fully meet the Asperger's in DSM-4. So we're trying to work through social communication disorder to make sure that those individuals who didn't have restrictive repetitive behaviors but had the impairments of social communication will be covered. So to speak then to uh, one of the big concerns people have with uh, diagnostic codes as they relate to insurance billing, um, it sounds to me like autism spectrum disorder will carry forward the diagnostic code that used to be autism and therefore in states that recognize autism as a medical disorder not a mental health disorder what used to be Asperger's now becomes the medical disorder. Is that your interpretation too? That will depend on ICD-11. The United States has chosen to skip ICD-10. ICD-9 codes will continue until ICD-11 is published. Our work group for DSM-5 has been working very hard with the ICD-11 Neurodevelopmental Disorders Committee. In fact, we just had a call with Mike Rutter, who's heading up that subcommittee. Uh, they may retain separation of autism versus autism spectrum disorders, but the coding will be the same. Well, if we, if we certainly, if we could combine them into one, I think that would be a good thing for our community. For, It'll be great, for but unfortunately, DSM-5 doesn't determine codes. We have diagnostic codes within there, but they're not the ICD codes that determine billing. Thank you. I had a last comment, then we have to move on. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask for children that have nonverbal or classic autism, um, this will obviously, they'll still be considered autism, but then there are sometimes children that um, that are verbal, that get a lot of behavior therapy or other methods of therapy, and that parents are willing and they want to lose the diagnosis, at least in, in my community. 
um, and some have lost the diagnosis of autism. But then when the intervention stops, unfortunately, it comes back. And so what happens sometimes is that do they have to be re-diagnosed again, or how would that work with? We hope that the um, ability to have currently or by history counts uh -huh. means that autism would be a lifelong diagnosis, as with many lifelong diagnoses, it doesn't necessarily have to be causing impairments at the present time and would not necessarily be um, an object of attention for services delivery. But the diagnosis would remain, and it could be that one of the specifiers is in remission, if that's the situation. So then when sometimes insurance companies or even Medicaid, when a lot of advocates say, we want this therapy to be approved because the best outcome is to lose the diagnosis, then it's important to say, it could come back, and it's important to keep that, at least on paper, the diagnosis, so that you can get the therapy later on at 15 or, you know, 12 when you need it. Right. This is a bigger di um, discussion among the entire DSM-5 task force because there are a number of disorders that are in exactly that situation. And so it's not clear whether for specifically for autism and um, the learning disabilities and some of the other conditions within our chapter, the neurodevelopmental disorders chapter, we will have specifier in remission, or whether that would be something that would be um, a larger issue for the whole diagnostic manual. Well, thank you. Sue, there's been a lot of misunderstanding about this, so it's going to be important. Maybe the IACC can help to get the word out. In a, this is much clearer than descriptions I've seen previously. It's very, very helpful. Um, John had asked about insurance, and that, in fact, is the next topic up. And so I want to move to hearing from Stuart Spielman and Peter Bell, both of Autism Speaks, who are going to talk about recent developments in insurance coverage for individuals with ASD. And uh, I think what we'll do is um, leave some additional